So just starting the recording. So welcome everyone to our Plastic Free July cook-along with Anne-Marie, the Zero Waste Chef, who's going to give us this morning some tips, ideas, uh, tricks in this cook-along where she shows us how to cook when, uh, with stuff that we mostly already have in our homes, in our pantries and in our fridges. So Anne-Marie, I've got a copy of your beautiful new book in here and I've just been reading oh, the, thank you. the chapter um, about how to cook like grandma and I know we've spoken a few times about how um, this isn't just about uh, reducing our food waste, uh, our plastic waste, but also reducing our food waste at the same time when we cook with what we already have. So I'm going to hand over to you in your kitchen. And um, if anyone has any questions as we go along, please feel free to pop them in the Q&A. And I'll be, Anne-Marie's going to be busy cooking as we're watching and joining along. So I'll ask you any questions as we go. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Rebecca. Thank you for having me. This is a real honor to uh, do this cook along for Plastic Free July. So I guess if you haven't already chopped your vegetables, if you're cooking along, you can start that while I talk a little bit. Um, so I would chop the onion and the vegetables, and garlic and ginger. And uh, so I'll just talk a little bit about how I started. So 10 years ago, I was reading about plastic pollution in the oceans. And I told my older daughter at the time, Mary Catherine, I said, we have to get off of this stuff. I was just so horrified as you all are, who are here tonight or this morning or you know wherever you are <laughs> here now. Um, so we started with the plastic and then I became more aware of all the waste, including food waste. And when you cut down on your food waste, you're also going to cut down on plastic waste because you are probably buying at least some stuff in plastic. So if you buy food in plastic and you don't eat the food, you throw out the food and the plastic. So I use everything in my kitchen now. Uh, I've always cooked, but cutting the waste like that it's made me much more creative. So like most people, I think, when I would think about what am I going to make for dinner, I'd look up a recipe and I'd see something and think, okay, that looks really good. Write down all the ingredients, go to the store, buy the ingredients, come home, prep everything, make the dish. I'd have the leftovers of the dish and then the leftovers of all the little bits and pieces. And if you do that a few times a week, that can really pile up. So now instead, and a lot of people have been doing this during the pandemic, I look in the refrigerator and see what do I have? And then I decide what I'm gonna make for dinner based on that. And if you do that, you will slash your food waste and you'll cut a lot of packaging waste too, if you're buying food in packages. So this fried rice is a really good example. And I panicked a little bit because if you got the list, if, if you have the list pulled up, um, I call for a couple of cups of chopped vegetables and I just had one broccoli head <laughs> and I chopped that's not quite, well, it's got like not quite two cups, but I have this jar of kimchi that I made for another class. And, you know, in the old days, I wouldn't have thought to do this. So when I make my kimchi to, so when you ferment food, I have to back up a little bit. The most important thing to remember is that you submerge all of the vegetables in liquid in a brine while they are fermenting. So these are, these are not actively fermenting, so they're not submerged. Anyway, so I will put a cabbage leaf on top and then I'll put a little jar on that and I, when I close the lid, it pushes everything down. And I thought, huh, I have this cabbage leaf. Why don't I just chop this up and put it in my kimchi? And in the old days, I wouldn't have thought of that, but I thought this will be a perfect use for my, for my cabbage leaf because I want, 
I want a few more vegetables in my, in my mix. So I'm just gonna chop that up. Uh, let's see. And I have an onion. Um, I actually, I forgot to get the scallions, the green onions, but if you are chopping your everything right now, oh, sorry, need a towel. If you're chopping everything right now, you can save your green onions. I'm sure you've seen this all over the internet. So I saved the little ends and then I put them in water and they regrow and then I plant them outside. So I just haven't had time to, well, these, these don't have much on them yet to plant outside. So anyway, so I'm gonna do that. Um, th and this is from my kimchi. That's the bottom of my Napa cabbage. So I'm regrowing that. Mm, has some little shoots coming out at the bottom. So that might work. If it doesn't work and I plant it, I'm returning it to the soil. And it entertains me when I look at these. Every day I check on them, my little babies. So, oh, also when you're prepping, save all your little ends and pieces of vegetables. So here I have a few little bits of onion and I'm just going to put them in my jar. I put some, I put the garlic skins. I have some, I chopped some garlic for this dish and I keep this in the freezer. And when I have enough and when I need broth, I just pull that out, simmer it in water and I make vegetable broth. So I haven't bought broth in about 10 years and I know what's in it. There's no Tetra Pak. I don't know about Australia, but here in the US, almost all the broth comes in Tetra Packs and, you know, a couple of municipalities recycle Tetra Packs, which as we all know, isn't the answer. You know, reduction is better, but also this tastes delicious and it's free. So if anyone can think of a downside to not reducing your food waste, please put it in the chat because I can't come up with one. There's just, you save money, the food is delicious. You're a more creative cook because you have these parameters, like you have to use this, this, and this. It's kind of like a cooking show where they give you some ingredients and say, okay, you have 20 minutes, make dinner. And you have to come up with something, except without that pressure. So, all right, I think that's uh, everything I wanted to talk about before I start cooking. So I will turn on my, oh, which one? Okay, uh, let's see. I think I, I think I say medium high in the recipe for the heat. My daughter was asking me the other day, I had my, I had my cookbook out and I had it open. I was making a fruit crumble. And she said, you have to look at the recipe. And I said, well, yeah, I, I don't have this stuff memorized. I have to, I have to look up my own recipes. I can't remember, except for the sourdough bread. I have that one memorized, which is probably the most detailed one, but I've made it so many times. That one I do. Okay, sorry. So let me just, yes, medium high heat. Now I don't have coconut oil or peanut oil or walnut oil. So I'm just gonna use my olive oil. I love this olive oil. Um, I get it in Napa Valley, which is just north of me. I have a friend who goes there all the time and keeps me supplied. And these are really nice glass jugs that I either, well, give away or use them for water or kombucha or whatever. Okay, so I'm going to put in a quarter cup. I'm just gonna eyeball it. Okay, pretend, pretend that's a quarter cup. I think it's about a quarter cup. I'm gonna let that heat up and I'm going to start off by um, sauteing the garlic and the ginger. And then I will add the, do that for a couple minutes and then I'll add the onions. So I, where are they? So you heard my chopped, that was a really big onion, one chopped onion. Now the rice, this works better, fried rice works best if the rice is left over and kind of dried out, which is nice. I'm like, really kind of being aggressive with this spoon. Um, it's really nice because 
you know, you might forget, you might not get to it right away, you know, might be in your fridge for a couple of nights, but, and you might think, oh no, I've wasted the rice, but it's perfect. Because if it's fresh rice, it will just clump. It's still gonna taste good, but it turns out nicer if it's kind of dried out. So if you forget, that works in your favor. If you forget that you've got rice that's, you know, a few nights old. All right, well, hopefully that's hot enough. I'm going to, oh, my ginger. No, I didn't tell you about my ginger. Where's my, oh, this is my ginger bug. I named my starters. Her name is Marianne. Oh, and, and this, is, this is Eleanor, my sourdough starter, which has nothing to do with what I'm making, but I'm just showing you my pets. So this is a starter that I use to make fermented drinks. It might, oh wait, my microphone's here. Oh, did you hear that? Makes a little pop when you open it because it's fermenting. A uh, ginger bug is just ginger, sugar, and water. It ferments like a, like a sourdough starter, and then you can use it to make ginger beer or carbonated lemonade. I make um, hibiscus soda with it, and uh, all kinds of carbonated drinks is delicious. But another nice thing about it, if chopping ginger is not your favorite thing, well, if you have a ginger bug, you have a whole jar full of little bits. And so this is what I use when I'm cooking something like this or doll or other dishes that call for ginger. So this is really handy. And then you have a use for the ginger bits because when you make your soda, you don't use the ginger bits. You just strain them out. Although you can also make a drink with just the ginger bits. You can carbonate it with just those because they have a lot of bacteria and yeast on them. So I'm going to add my garlic, making sure you can see. <laughs> um, I did four cloves of, of minced garlic and I'm going to add, well, a couple teaspoons of, of this ginger. I, I forget exactly what I said in the, in the recipe I sent. I think, ooh, oh no, it's, it's splashing me. Oh, my hands are packing me. All right, so I'm going to stir that up just for a minute or two. Anne-Marie, uh, I've, got a, couple, want... I've oh, got a couple great. of questions for you, Anne-Marie. So someone's asking, is, is rice bran or macadamia oil a suitable substitute for olive oil? Uh, macadamia oil, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the first one. Rice bran oil? Rice bran oil. I've never used that. Um, I imagine it would be fine. I don't see why not. Macadamia, that sounds delicious. So you could, okay. you could use any type of oil? I think so. I mean, oil you cook other stuff with. I, I would use that. Uh, okay, I'm going to add the onions. Because I, I, so my, um, this is just browning a tiny bit. I actually don't want it to brown um, too much. So time to add the onion. And I just chopped it up like uh, chopped, you know, not minced. And this I'm going to cook for, I don't know, a few minutes. Let me check the recipe over here. <laughs> How long do I cook this for? I, I, I make this all the time, but um, I, I do want to check what I what I told you in the. Oh, okay, so uh, yeah, about five minutes. I'm gonna saute this, and then I'm going to add my my random vegetables. In this case, broccoli and that cabbage leaf. I actually, you know what? I want a little bit more kimchi. So I'm gonna grab just a, a little bit more. I love kimchi and it's very easy to make. You just, you chop vegetables, you know, add salt and spices and you add them to a jar. And then you let the vegetables ferment for a few days and you're done. 
And this will keep in my refrigerator for, if I don't eat it quickly, it'll, it'll keep for months. Sometimes kimchi, unlike sauerkraut, it can get uh, soft. And then you can make kimchi stew with it. So nothing goes to waste here. Oh, okay, I better stir this. Uh-oh. Well, I hope everyone's plastic-free July is off to a good start. I we're first getting... read about it. Oh, pardon me? I was just going to say, Anne-Marie, we're getting lots of questions about your um, ginger bug, but I might just oh, hang okay. on till that to the end and um, ask you them all at once rather than distract you from the fried rice. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, yeah, I love, I love uh, ginger beer, it's delicious. And the ginger bug, it only takes about five days to make. And then once you have it established, just like a sourdough starter, you just feed it regularly to keep it alive. So it takes about five days to establish it, but you don't have to make a new one every time and wait five days to to make something okay that's that's looking good it's kind of here I, i'll bring it over hopefully you can see oh it's kind of softened a little bit i'm going to add uh my lone head of broccoli like when i looked in the fridge this morning i was kind of panicky i thought ah i don't have anything for this cook along but, but I did. So there's my broccoli and I'll add my chopped kimchi. Oh. And saute it again for about another five minutes. Oh, it smells really good. The kimchi. So I've never done this combination before, I don't think. Usually I do all kimchi when I do fried rice. I do um, kimchi fried rice. But it's really pretty with the broccoli in with it. So and it smells really good. And then this is actually, you know, it's quite a bit of food. So we'll, well, depending on how many people you have. I'd say it'll it'll feed about three people. Depends on how hungry they are, how big their appetites are. Okay, I need to turn it up a bit. I think I turned it down. Everyone's stove is different. That's another thing I discovered writing a cookbook, which I well, I think I kind of knew that anyway, but you know, really hit home because I had to have all of the recipes tested. And some people would say, oh, this cooked in, you know, 15 minutes. And other people would say, oh, it took, took 25. And, and I, um, I cooked everything in a step up from an easy bake oven, this little tiny oven. But it, it worked. Right, I'm going to show you how this is looking. There all the, it looks yummy. I think. Oh, okay, let me put that back. Oh, I'm gonna close my kimchi. But and my ginger bug. Uh, okay, let me see. Am I forgetting anything? No, nope, not nope, got everything in there. And then after this, I'm going to add some soy sauce. And I don't have sesame oil. If I need more oil, I'll add a little bit more. Um, olive oil. I probably will need that because it does get pretty sticky with all the rice. Okay, so that's that's good enough. You don't have to keep watching me do that. Uh, okay, so the next step, I'm going to add the rice, and you want to break it up with your spoon while you're cooking it. Okay, I'm adding my. I added four cups. This was kind of compact though. So four, four cups of sort of, uh, not exactly fluffy, but mine was really packed into the pot. And so I, 
I took a lot a little a little bit less because it was it was a lot of rice. I should have given the weight. That's what I should have done. Okay, but this you know this recipe is it's not like baking. It's not like chemistry where oh you know it's you're gonna ruin it. Sorry, I'm looking around. Oh, here we go. My soy sauce and a couple of tablespoons of that. It's good with kimchi brine in it too. I'm, uh, I'm slightly obsessed with kimchi. And I'm probably going to need more oil, like I said. So now I'm just gonna stir this up. Uh, if you don't eat eggs, because we're gonna do that, I'm gonna do the eggs at the end. You could uh, do tofu, sort of silky tofu. And if you wanna make tofu, I have a recipe for that on my blog. Um, it's zerowastechef.com. The secret to making tofu is this coagulant called um, nagari. I've tried using Epsom salt, food grade Epsom salt, <clears throat> as the coagulant, and it's okay. It makes sort of a softer tofu, which actually would be fine for this. But the gochugaru makes really good tofu, and I'm Spoiled, I can get that at the bulk store north, just north of me in San Francisco. Okay, I'm gonna add a little bit more of my olive oil because this is kind of sticking, and I did have in there a couple of tablespoons of sesame oil, which I can also get in bulk at Rainbow. And the bulk bins were closed. Let's see, when I so I was stranded in Canada at the start of COVID. And at that time, um, the bulk bins were closed. Then they opened them. And then recently, they started allowing people to bring their own containers again. All right, so that looks good. Now, um, I'm going to crack my eggs. Now, these are, these are pasture-raised eggs from well-treated hens. I get them either at the farmer's market or from a friend. These ones are from the farmer's market. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna crack them in the bowl. Oh, whoop, got a little bit of shell in there, extra calcium. Um, I'm gonna whisk them up, make a well in the center of my, whoops, not, uh, well, Oops, I got all the shell out, so that's good. Okay, there, got that. Stir this up a little bit, because it don't want it to uh, burn. And Marie, I've got some more questions for you. So oh, great. someone's asking, could they use vegetable stock instead of oil with the rice? I haven't done that, but I think that sounds like a good idea. Um, it shouldn't stick too much if you do that. It shouldn't stick to the pan. Um, I'm gonna have to try that. I think that sounds like a good idea. Oh, the one thing I forgot was a fork. Okay, well, I have a spoon. Okay, I'm gonna whisk. There you can, I don't know if you can see, but these eggs, because they're from the farmer's market, like they're the nice, nice, uh, rich yellow color. Or like I said, you could put tofu in. Okay, so I've scrambled those up a little bit. A fork works best, but I'm adapting. And then I put them in the center. And I stir them around. Whoop. And let them cook. Where's my, where's, oh, there it is. So I cook, let, I do this for a couple of minutes and then just incorporate the eggs into everything else. And then sprinkle on a little salt to taste if you want some salt. Oh, oh I forgot the acid. Right, I need to add that too. So, um, oh, and I can tell you about my vinegar because uh, I'm super excited about my vinegar. So a little bit of acid in food makes it taste really good. I have a little bit in there already from the kimchi, but not too much. So this is, uh-oh, 
This is pineapple scrap vinegar. So in my book, I have a recipe for a drink called Tapachi, and that's a fermented drink made with pineapple peels and cores. All you do is you put pineapple peels and cores and sugar and water into a jar. You put water in just to kind of cover the, the fruit. You don't, you don't fill it up really high. And the bacteria and yeast present on the fruit, they eat the sugars in, in the fruit and the sugar that you put in there. They're anaerobic. So when they're submerged in, in the water, they get to work. They eat all of that sugar and they excrete carbon dioxide and acid and make a delicious drink. And it's slightly alcoholic. If you leave it for a longer time, it gets more alcoholic. And um, I make two infusions with the pineapple peels and cores because they have quite a bit of sugar and pineapple juice still in them. The second infusion, I use half as much water and sugar, I believe it's in my book, but I make it more concentrated because, you know, the kind of pills have already done their thing once. And then for the third infusion, I make vinegar. So I let this turn into vinegar after it goes alcoholic. It's super vinegary now. I tasted it yesterday, but this batch, I have this happen regularly, but never like this. It grew a mother of vinegar. This is a mother of vinegar in there. It looks a lot like a kombucha scoby. And my daughter came home, oh, a while ago. She First she came for something, I forget. And then she came home for Mother's Day. Anyway, the first time she came, she'd, she brought a bottle of white wine. Oh, okay, now this is cooked. So now I'm, now I'm gonna, Distribute it through my rice. Okay, so she brought home wine. The first visit, second visit, I don't know, a month later from Mother's Day, she said, you didn't drink that wine. And I said, no, it's, it's still sitting there. It's probably not so good now. And she said, no, it isn't. But I grew that mother of vinegar. So now I'm making white wine vinegar with that, with that white wine that nobody drank. And if I get my hands on red wine, I'll make red wine vinegar. Wine will spontaneously turn into vinegar, or not spontaneously, but I'm left to its own devices. It will, it will turn to vinegar. But if you have a mother of vinegar, the, your results will be more consistent. So I'm very excited about that. And all right, this, is, this looks done. So I'm going to add a little splash of my my scrap pineapple vinegar to it. It's, it's really strong. It's good stuff. I need to strain this, strain it and bottle it. I'm actually hoping more, more mother of vinegar grows on top, but I mean, I have, I have a good size one there. Ooh, whoops. Okay, so I'm just gonna add like a couple spoonfuls, tablespoons maybe, or I'll taste it and see. So I didn't mention that. When you cook like this, it's important to taste as you go. And then you can, I gotta turn this down a little bit because it's done. Um, yeah, then you can determine if it needs a little bit of something else. So maybe it needs more salt or whatever. Oh, okay. And I don't have a utensil. Um, okay. Oh no. Uh, let's see, I have something over here. There, that's good enough. So I'm just going to taste this, see if it needs salt. Mm. Oh, it's yummy. I think it needs a little salt. And I think I'll add a little bit more vinegar. A little bit. Okay. And where did my salt? Here's my salt. Oh, I'll just add a, you know, pinch is, here's a pinch. It's, sorry, the light is so bright. Hmm. Well, it's between your thumb and your index finger. You make a pinch. So just put that in there. 
And there, I'm going to pronounce this finished. Oh, uh, I'll show you too. I'll bring I'll bring it up to the the camera. And there we go. There it is. That smells really yummy. And I used up a bunch of stuff. So I'm going to move it off of the heat. There. And Marie, is there any vegetables that you wouldn't put in your fried rice? Huh. Well, usually I put carrots and celery and beans and things like that. I I don't know. Uh, I have never put Brussels sprouts in it. I don't I don't know what that would taste like. It probably tastes fine. I haven't put kale in it. I don't think I probably have. I think I have done kale. Oh, that's another thing. The kale stems. You can eat those. I mean, a lot of some of you probably already know all of this stuff I'm telling you, but um, usually recipes tell you to strip the kale off of the stems and just chuck the stems. I chop those up finely and I'll put them in stuff like this. So yeah, I definitely put, have put kale in my in my stir fry. And also that's good for omelets or, you know, just whatever you're going to put vegetables in. I'm sorry, I can't think of any vegetables that that I wouldn't put in it. I mean, well, I guess lettuce. I, you know, that's just water, really. Well, I mean, all vegetables have tons of water, but something limp like that. Although spinach, spinach might be good, but I think maybe crunchier vegetables, more substantial vegetables, are better in it. And. Uh, different types of rice. Would you do anything differently if you had uh, brown rice? No, no, I just make it the same. Just make sure for best results, use rice that is, you know, older, that's been in the refrigerator. Cook, cook, like you don't want to cook it, you know, right before you make it. But no, I've, I've been trying different rice. This is, today I used, um, I'm looking around for my rice. I used uh, white jasmine rice, but I, I use all, all kinds of different rice though. So. I have a little bit of farro in the cupboard because I love it for, I grind it up for flour. I have, I have a flour mill and my sourdough starter really likes it. Um, and it's kind of like rice. And I've thought about trying, trying this with that. It's much more sturdy than rice. It's the grains are much more defined when you cook them. They're not, you know, clumpy. And I'm wondering if that. I think that would taste good. It'd be much more expensive, but I think it will be good. We've got people making some delicious fried rice. We've got someone making with onions inside of vinegar, purple broccoli, yellow capsicum, bok choy, and leftover quinoa. And someone else. Oh, yum. Someone else using red and green peppers, zucchini, and snap peas with leftover brown basmati rice. Oh, that and sounds delicious. You really delicious. can use anything, can't you? Yeah. Oh, mushrooms are really good. Um, yeah, just, you know, sometimes you might have one carrot in the refrigerator and you might wonder, what am I going to do with this one carrot? But if you combine it with other random vegetables, this is a really good dish. And everybody seems to like it. I, I can't think of, I don't think, I don't think my kids when they were little ever turned their nose up, but nose is up at something like fried rice. And um, you um, talk about like the, the cost of food waste. I know the, the figures that you have are for, um, for the average American, but just, you know, what's it costing us, Anne-Marie, to waste so much food? Oh, it, well, so it costs consumers a fortune. In the US, the average family of four throws out or buys $1,800 worth of food that goes uneaten. 
So they either throw it out or compost it or, or whatever. But um, yeah, it's crazy. It's, Is it's, that every year? Yeah, every year. Yeah, sorry. Every year. Yep. And I'm from Canada. In Canada, the numbers are actually a little high or even. And, um, but then, you're, you know, you're not wasting just the food. You're wasting, we're, we're wasting the, the water. We're in a severe drought here in California right now. And two thirds of the fruit and vegetables come from California for the country. And we, we don't have any water. So the waste, wasting food wastes water. It wastes energy, uh, chemical inputs that go into the ground to grow the food. We clear the land of trees for to grow food that no one will eat. So there's there's that cost, you know, to the farmers and the I'm sure it's all, you know, pushed out onto the consumer. So yeah, like yeah. I said, there's there's really no downside to eating all of the food we buy. Unless you only buy chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> and then maybe you shouldn't eat all the food you buy if, if, that's, if you open the cupboards and it's all cookies. Can I ask you a few questions about your um, your ginger bug? So oh, sure. I had some questions around um, how long it takes for, to get uh, fermented and how long you keep it in the fridge, as well as if you have any, uh, is it possible to make a diabetic friendly ginger bug? Oh. I don't know. It needs caloric sugar to needs for the um, for its food. So I'm not sure about that. I'd have to look into that. I'm. I mean, I'm. I'm, I'm thinking no, but I don't know. I don't know. Um, I'm sorry. What was the other part of that question? Oh, how long? Yeah. All right. So uh, the first day. You get a nice, you know, clean jar. You don't have to sterilize it. There's no point in sterilizing because as soon as you open it, the bacteria and yeast are going to colonize it again. So you put in a tablespoon of organic ginger because if it's not organic, it may have been irradiated and that will kill the good bacteria and yeast that you want to make your ginger bug. So of all the things I've fermented, the only thing that did not bubble to life and some of my ferments may not have tasted spectacular, but they all bubbled to life, except for the one. And it was pickled ginger, well, fermented ginger. It just didn't come to life. It was dead, dead ginger. And, and so I realized, okay, I must have bought non-organic ginger. Now that's in the US. I don't know what the laws are in Australia, but here, if it has been irradiated, then, or if, sorry, if it's if, if it doesn't say organic, there's a chance it has been irradiated. So tablespoon of that minced organic ginger in the jar, tablespoon of sugar, about a cup and a cup and a quarter of water. Stir that up. The next day, add another tablespoon of ginger, tablespoon of sugar. Do that every day. And then around day five, it should be ready to make a drink. And it's ready when, oh, hopefully you can see this. There's this white, white yeast on the bottom of the jar. So that's the good stuff. And it will taste tangy, not just gingery and sugary. It'll taste sweet, sweet and tangy. And some of the ginger bits will float to the top. At that point, you can make a drink. And you'll make an infusion. If you're making ginger beer, then you make an infusion uh, of ginger. I simmer a bunch of ginger and water on the stove. And then I strain it. I add sugar to it. And after it cools, I strain off the ginger bug, put it in that, put it in a bottle, the flip top type. I don't think I have one out on the counter, but the flip top type works really well. Uh, the carbonation will build up inside as the bacteria eat the sugar. Um, I put it in my kitchen cupboard for a couple of days and then I will burp it. I'll open the, so I burped this. Well, I, I mean, I opened it. So but at the beginning and I don't know if anyone heard it, but it made a hiss. 
that was the carbon dioxide coming out. And you want to do that because if you leave it, it could explode. You could have an, ex an exploding bottle, which I've never had and I hope I never do. But it does happen, happen to my daughter with her kombucha. And uh, if you like the flavor, it's ready. The nice thing about ginger beer, I think, is, you know, ferments, the, the flavor changes as it continues to ferment. So kombucha gets more vinegary as the bacteria and yeast eat the sugar. It becomes more vinegary and it becomes so vinegary that you may not want to drink it. But ginger beer still tastes good. I mean, it just, it tastes good at every, I think, at, at every period. If it's a little sweet and it's less sweet, it's actually, it actually gets more alcoholic. It's just a little bit alcoholic. Um, so it's ready depending on whether you like it or not. But a couple of days after you've made the ginger bug. And oh yeah, and then when it's ready, put it in the refrigerator because otherwise um, it's gonna ferment really quickly. It will still continue to ferment in the refrigerator, but much more slowly. So that's how you do the, the ginger bug. Oh. Thanks, Anne-Marie. Um, it's oh. been, so I'm quietly weeping over here because my onion was so strong that I chopped up. Um, but it's been so lovely to, to be invited into your kitchen. Can we have another look at your beautiful fried rice there? Oh, sure. Well, let me grab my towel because the pot is hot. Yeah, it looks yummy. I'm going to, it's now about, well, it's about quarter to eight. So I'm going to look for something to watch on Netflix and eat some of this. So yeah, just so simple. Like Julia Child said, you don't have to make cook masterpieces, just use quality fresh ingredients, which is what I do. I get, I put the good stuff in my, in my dishes. Oh, you, you put the good stuff in your dishes and I think you inspire all of us to put the good stuff into our bodies and to really limit not just our plastic waste and all of our other packaging, but also to, to limit our food waste and by shopping locally, avoiding our food, yeah. avoiding yep, food yep. waste, eating fresh local produce and using what we have, I think together we can all make a difference. So from all of us who joined in and were listening, thank you very much. Keep, please keep doing what you're doing. Can you give us a quick squeeze again of the, the cover of your book? Um, oh, sure. I, I have your book here, oh, too, which I'm book. really enjoying. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, it's I really have it's really inspiring oh, uh, to, to learn the whole story. And, and this is mine. This is the uh, this is the US edition, which if you're in Australia, um, this is the one you would get either from book depository or oh there's a big Australian uh, book store. Is it Booktopia? Okay. Yeah, yeah that's where <laughs> I had to get mine from. Yeah. Oh, oh thank you. Thank you for buying it. Yeah, and it's got um it's vegetarian and vegan and um i think my my the book designer did a really lovely job Ooh, those are the empamosas so pastry 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 slashes your food waste because you can fill it with anything so more pastry less food waste <laughs> And what I also like about it when I was just trying something this morning from your book is that when you put it on the counter, it just stays open at the recipe without having to put something heavy on it. So Oh, does it? Oh, it good. It does. So thank you very much. Um, and you've got lots more recipes and ideas on your blog, zero waste chef, is it dot com? Yep, dot com. Yep. And I so, just, uh, right before Plastic Free July, I updated my recipe index because I had neglected to put a few things on there that I, I mean, like for months, <laughs> I hadn't updated it, so. Oh, thank you. Thank you for being such a fountain of knowledge for inspiring us and millions of people around the world. And 
We're all very much looking forward to having fried rice for dinner tonight. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for having me, Rebecca. This is a real honor. Oh, it, it's an honor to be invited into your kitchen and just wish we could be there in person, but maybe one day. <laughs> yeah, 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 one day. Okay. Thank you nice. very much. Okay. Bye -bye. Well, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Happy Plastic-Free July. Bye. Yeah, happy Plastic-Free July.